Welcome to Promote Profit Publish. I'm your host, Juliette Clark. And the training that we're going to see today is one that I gave to Jared Rosen's Dream Sculpt group back in February. And um, we had major tech problems, so I had to re record. So if this is something that you want to see the slides, which you may want to, I definitely want you to go over to our YouTube channel, Super Brand Publishing. And uh, check it out there because you can follow along with the slides. So before I get started, I want to remind you to go over to AIAuthorAcademy.com. We have a class in April of 2024 that we are putting on to teach authors how to build their platforms with AI. You may think that AI is uh, a little like out of bounds, scary to use. It's really easy to use. And when you're building your audience, there are lots of ways to validate, get information, create social media posts, newsletters. I mean, it, it is just endless finding where to go get speaking gigs, but you have to know how to do it. And it may require a couple different platforms. And the big thing is we're going to show you our exact formula that we use between how we take our videos, how we get our shorts from them, how we take the uh, transcription from the shorts and run it through AI to get social media posts and where we house all that. So it's really easy for us to cut and paste and put it right into social media. So basically we're gonna teach you how to do your content calendar using AI. And I know for me using it, I have streamlined what I do to where my calendar, my content calendar is literally down to about an hour or to an hour and a half a month. And we post six days a week. So you can tell if you're doing a little bit less that once you get going with it, you're going to start building a very robust platform. So second thing, we now have an audio book wing of our company. You can find out about it at superbrandaudiobooks.com. That will get you an appointment with me or the ability to ask for a quote on it. One of the things that's amazing about this is the company that we partnered with is known for being the biggest audio company out there that gives you a producer and allows you to record your own book. There are really high standards on all of the audio platforms. So to have a producer there to tell you, hey, you're huffing or this is happening or that's happening or we need to redo this um, is really a big help. And if you're an influencer or even trying to be an influencer, your book is a nurture tool and people want to hear your voice, especially if you have a YouTube channel, a Rumble channel, a podcast, somewhere where people are already listening to your voice, they're going to expect that that book is done in your voice. So go grab a, an appointment if you haven't converted your book yet. It's at superbrandaudiobooks.com and stay tuned for the training with Dream Sculpt. Well, welcome back, you guys. Um, really excited to be here. Unfortunately, we had some tech problems last night, so I had to re-record this. So unfortunately, at the end, you won't have the questions, which was there were some really great questions. If I can remember them at the end, I will put them out there. But um, I'm super excited to share this because the number one thing that I hear from authors on a regular basis is I don't have time to build my platform. I'm a solopreneur. I don't have time to build up a YouTube channel. I don't have time to build up a podcast. I don't have time for blogging. And all of that is your trust. So that's where AI has become such a great tool because we actually take our blog and run it through ChatGPT. And you know, we, we do a lot with different platforms. We use Opus extensively. So, um, but the first thing you have to do with this is get your avatar ready. I know a lot of you are kind of playing with AI and you don't really understand it. Um, but that is really the basis. Okay, now this doesn't want to go. There we go. Um, the basis for a lot of work and streamlining this work in a really meaningful way to keep you on track with audience building. So you must have a digital footprint to attract readers. 
And that is just unavoidable right now. Uh, there is so much that has to be done with platform building. And I'm gonna show you a formula in a minute that will explain not only why you probably didn't get a traditional contract or you haven't, but the way that you can estimate based on audience size, how many books you'll sell. And I think you'll be really amazed at what that looks like at the end of the day. So, Audience engagement matters because the size of your audience and the engagement of your audience really formulates what you can expect to sell for books. The bare minimum to get a contract from a traditional publisher is they want to know that you can sell 5,000 books in the first year. So the way they come up with that 5,000 books is they take your total social media, your podcast or YouTube or a TV show, whatever you have radio show, and your list, your email list. So they look at those numbers today, they look at the engagement, and then they determine, will this book be profitable? <clears throat> and I can tell you from talking to a couple agents, they don't even look at your proposals. When they get a proposal, um, that's either been written by you or someone else. And when they look at it, they go straight to the audience size. And they do that not because they don't think you have great content, but they can't sell a book to a traditional publisher who's in the business of making money from your books. Um, they can't sell it unless they can pr provide an audience that will meet these numbers. Now, I threw my numbers in here. And you can see that I have 17,000 on social media. I'm only on LinkedIn. I get about 22,000 podcast uh, down, down, downloads monthly. And my list is at about 5,000 people. And I have to be super honest, I am not great at the list building um, because I look at my open rate and I start deleting. Which, by the way, that was the strategy that someone who started out in this industry at the same time I did, she writes books for a living. She writes fiction books. And her list was the main focus of building. And she actually gives away old books to build the list, which if you have a back catalog, that's a great idea. But even better is she goes through her list about once a quarter and she says, if you haven't opened in 30 days, she'll send out an email and say, I am deleting you because you haven't opened in 30 days. If you'd like to get back on at some point, please do that. What's the, uh, what, what did that do for her? She has a constantly clean list of about 20 to 25,000 people, and she actually got a book out there with co-writing with uh, Nora Roberts because of the size of her audience, because of her work and what she's done to not only to build her platform, but to get out there. So she is now a New York Times bestseller because of that. Now, if you want to be a New York Times bestseller because you'll get more speed, there are a lot of advantages to it. I will tell you that to work with uh, anybody that I know on building that, where they build your platform and they write the book and they get the book published, you're looking at about 130 to 150,000, depending on who you go with. So um, either way, you have to build it. There's no way around it. So artificial intelligence can really streamline this process, but here's the problem. It is a garbage in, garbage out system. You are teaching it and it is a large language model. So if you put garbage in and you're teaching it with garbage, your output is going to be garbage. So AI can only give you results based on the specific information that you input. And we call that information a prompt. So whatever the prompt is, that's what you're going to get. Now, when I put things in, I'm very specific about the tone I want to use and the audience that I'm catering to. And that's why we get such great stuff that connects. I would say, even though I go in and I finesse it because you don't always just wanna be AI, AI, AI all the time, but a lot of times I will go in and finesse the newsletter or finesse an email because I don't like some of the language on it. So um, that's why we're gonna jump in today to how can you build that avatar stronger so that you're connecting with the right people from day one and your book is written in the language that speaks to the right people. So like I said, the more focused you are with the input, the better your output results will be.
So what we're going to talk about is how to rebuild your avatar. And um, we're going to do this with specificity. And I'm going to have you be have you do market research as well. One of the big things that I learned from advertising, and I worked on a billion dollar account, is those ads you see on TV are very, very expensive. Those radio ads, the talent, everything is very expensive to produce for an advertising agency. So the brands spend an enormous amount of money on market research, sometimes even focus groups. So um, I used to be that person who was, I don't know if you remember it, it back in the eighties and nineties, you know, you might've gotten pulled over in a mall and say, Hey, would you like to come in and see this video? Uh, Hollywood did it a lot too, with the multiple endings to movies, but um, you'd go into a room and we'd show you and we'd get feedback and there'd be lots of M&Ms and Diet Coke. I do remember that. I was a little chubby back in those days from all the M&Ms, but um, what they, what it was, was that feedback loop. Now, of course, if I went into a mall today and I grabbed somebody and said, hey, will you go in the back room with me? Um, they'd probably call the cops. But back in the olden days, that's exactly what we do. There are ways for you to do a focus group online. And I really encourage you to do one, to learn uh, how to do one and do one because the market research is invaluable. So we're going to go over audience overview, brands and influencers, press and websites, and consumer semantics today, and then move into what I call gold language. So audience overview, this is building your demographics and building your psychographics. Now, this is where most people stop. Most laymen, small business, book writers, content writers, all of that, this is where they stop. And so it's very important, but it's also important that you don't stop here. So the first thing we're going to look at is age. What is the age of your audience? Now, the reason I say that is different age groups communicate in different ways. So my key age group demographic is 55 to 80. I'm getting those second wind people who have a, a just a boatload of um, experience in what they do. And now they're going in to be consultants or coaches or, you know, whatever they want to call themselves in a particular industry. Or maybe some of them are just, I've met a lot too, who are just like, you know, to retire is retiring. And I don't want to be tired. I don't want to be that guy, that man in the Barca lounger yelling at CNN on the television or, you know, whatever, whatever that stereotype is of, of older people. So what that means is I'm working with a group that has not grown up with technology. So when I start teaching them the technology, they're a little bit afraid, but that also means that they're probably not huge texters. They don't like it when they get a salesy pitch via text. They think it's annoying. I know I get them all the time and I think it's annoying. And um, so they they are more of the relationship people, the verbal. And, and I wish our whole society was like this because we were much more connected when we were verbally speaking to each other. Um, you'd be amazed at the power if I, I'm going to give you an example. My mother used to do this to me. She would, she would text me and it'd be all caps. And I'd literally be like, mom, quit yelling at me. And she's like, I'm not. And it would turn out that she was older and her caps lock was stuck or something. So there's a lot of misunderstanding that can help with those forms of communication. So understand the, the way that your particular age group demographic communicates, because that's probably one of the first keys. The second is gender. So when I say gender, if you cater to women, women communicate differently than men. So when you're writing copy, when you're writing courses, teaching, writing this book, it, if, if it is for women, you're going to want to connect on a really emotional level because that's more how we connect is feelings. And I know men hate this, but it is what it is. Um, if you work directly with men, they respond more to practical facts. Um, so you want to make sure that whatever you're doing is based like that as well. And if you have a mixture, it's even a little bit harder because you kind of have to mix it all together and it can be difficult to do with that. But that gender is super important. So do you work with men? Do you work with women? Do you work with both? How are you going to communicate? And paired with how are you going to communicate with that age group? 
The next, and, and right, to be honest, that last slide is where most people stop. So the next we're going to get into is educational level. So you want to be able to communicate in a way that isn't, I don't know, condescending, like you're the big leader and you're using big words. And maybe your people are people that are college students or they never graduated from college. Or the, the, the truth is that most people communicate on a seventh grade level, like it or not. That's the truth. There is actually something that happens, and I, I don't remember the name of the group that does it. At the end of every presidential election, they look at the communication of the winner versus the loser. And I'll give you an example, whether you agree or not. I don't mean to do, get political on this, but 2016, they, they determined Trump won because he communicated at a middle school level. Now, is that how we all communicate? No, but... If you're communi communicating to a broad audience, you want to communicate at their level. And if you look at Hillary Clinton, she assumed a postgraduate level of communication, which was really off-putting to a lot of people. I have to tell you, I have a postgraduate degree and I found it off-putting. So you really have to educate, you have to communicate at that educational level of your people. And that might be where that even gets more intense is, are you a train the trainer? So are you using jargon because you're training the people, maybe you're a psychologist and you train other psychologists, you're going to use psychological jargon. If you're not a train the trainer, then chances are you're going to have to, and I don't mean this in a bad way, you're going to have to dumb down that language a little bit because if you fire hose people with that aren't at that level with advanced, they're, they're just going to give up. And you want a high rate of return and rate people that finish your programs. Years of experience. This matters tremendously too. This goes back to that train the trainer. If you're a train the trainer and you've been in business in two years, chances are people who have 30, 40, you know, 20 years experience are not going to hire you. So you need to also look at the experience level of the people that you're working with. It's very important. Um, top majors and education. If you're working with people who are maybe in that 25 to 35 range, um, they probably don't have enough experience in an industry, so they're going to go back to what did they major in. And unfortunately, this is a tough one because a lot of people don't end up with jobs that they actually major in. Um, a great example is I worked at Price Stern Sloan because they had gardening books. I have uh, a degree in ornamental horticulture. So even though I started out using a little bitty bit of that knowledge, I actually was plunged into the publishing world where, you know, I had to learn a whole bunch of other things, take that knowledge, make sure that it was correct. So um, that can be for those people who are maybe haven't been in an industry a really long time. Um, also look at the top industries you're working with, because when we get into the gold language, I'm going to talk a little bit about the industries that use some of this um, some of these uh, gold, the letters that I'm going to articulate. So you want to use the language of that person. Um, and, and I'll give you a great example, just a little preview of that. The organizer in G-O-L-D, the O, tends to be lawyers and accountants. So you're going to need to learn a language that connects with them. It can't be a frivolous sales copy that, um, you know, they, they need different requirements and I'll get that in a little bit later. So go back through your list. This is what I wanna assign you guys to do. Go back through your, your past clients right now and figure out what is their education. If, if there, if it's something with majors, ask. You, you might actually be able to find this out on LinkedIn too, because a lot of times people will put their college that they went to and what they graduated in. And also the, the age, the gender, uh, all of this stuff we've just gone through, go back and look and see if you can see a pattern in that. That is what marketing is all about, is looking or marketing research, looking and finding those patterns that you can use for your marketing. So um, metro areas, this is super important too. And a lot of you, I hear complaints, oh, I ran ads 
um, but she ran ads to, you know, just a general population. Um, I actually know where my top five metro areas are that I get business from and my top five states. So what I would do if I were you is pull out a sheet of paper and write down, go through your client list or go through who you're meeting, where you're networking, where are those people from, write down that five top metro area and your top five states. I know that my top five states are California, Texas, Florida, Arizona, and I actually get quite a bit from New York as well, um, although no, probably not as much from New York as the others. Um, but know where those people are at, because if you decide to run ads or you're connecting or you're looking for speaking gigs, I know uh, Nan Nelson, when we were looking for speaking gigs for her uh her program, we were looking, she is in Eastern Ohio. So we were kind of looking Pennsylvania, Ohio. Could we go up a little bit? New York is right there. Cause she didn't want to do more than a day's travel if she was getting paid just because she has a really robust doctor practice as well, psychiatry practice. So um, if you know that now you can start focusing on those connections on LinkedIn, those connections on Facebook and seeing where those people are. So interests and skills, this is more kind of the psychographics area. This is really about where are you going to meet these people? What are they interested in? So if they're leadership coaches, you know, you're going to go, if you're someone who teaches leadership, you're going to go and look at companies that need leadership coaching. You're going to connect with the HR people. If you want public speaking, you're going to go connect with those people who have like-minded um, not only skills, but you're going to look for those people who have the, the topic that you're looking at. Um, when you meet people out in public, are they interested in education, children, arts and culture? I mean, um, you know, for me, I'm a publisher, but I'm also a painter. So I meet a lot of painters who talk to me about doing books. None of them ever do. But actually, I take that back. One did. Um, but that's that's some place where you're being exposed to people who are like minded who might want to do what you do. So really get into that when you're looking. Um, I'll give you another example. Top interest. Um, we had a children's book that released back in November, and it's an environmental book. This author, Sandra Ro Martinez, she actually goes out. She takes her child to beach cleanups. She takes her child to river cleanups, parks cleanups. And guess what? She takes her books with her and they talk about it. And she's now creating a club for kids that is uh, low cost where they can come and get more information and they can find out what more they can do for the environment. So really having that understanding where these people are at can actually give you a foot in the door to connect with them as well. So the importance of this is, who are we talking to? You know, there's a, there's a saying about when you write something for everyone, it'll be read by no one. It can't be really general. It's also how and where are you delivering content? If you're a psychologist, you over on Facebook, probably not going to be a great thing. Over on LinkedIn, much better. And I've probably told you guys the story before about the client that came to us in 2016, and she had a program that was solo to CEO. She taught people who were CEOs, uh, solopreneurs how to work on their business instead of in their business. We highly encouraged over and over and over, your people, your CEOs, they're over on LinkedIn. She insisted she was gonna stay on Facebook and it was a complete flop. And it was because she didn't look at where she was delivering the content. Were her people actually there? Copywriting. If you know who your people are, your copywriting is going to fit. A great example of this is Fran Acero. She has an older audience like me, so she tends to use the language of our older audience. Some of the, the, the I don't know, language or slang she uses, probably the younger generation just laughs at us. And then book development. So this is your voice. So when you know who these people are and you go back to those professions and you can see now you can use the right wor words for action takers and nurturers and analytics and, and you know who are these people and how do they communicate. The next area is brand and influence. And this is really where is your audience hanging out? 
So for many of us, we collect an audience on social media. I do a lot of in-person, not as much since 2020, but social media is probably my main delivery. So I actually did this uh, based on Brene Brown's profile. And when you look at Brene Brown, the same people that follow her, they follow Simon Sinek, Elizabeth Gilbert, uh, Marianne Williamson. So what this tells me is that I need to go over and find out where are the other places these people are. You can see Simon Sinek's on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, not on Pinterest, which is, by the way, a great place to sell books, and he's on YouTube. So now I'm looking at if I'm someone who is like a, you know, a, a spiritual um, you know, behavior person like Brene Brown, I'm going to see that most of these people who are also like her are in all the same places with the exception of Daniel Pink. Most of them are on Instagram. Most of them are on Facebook. All of them are on Twitter and some of them are on YouTube. So you want to be in those same places as well. Podcasts, you know, you might go back and just do a survey, ask your audience, existing audience, hey, what are the podcasts you listen to most? I know I listen to audiobooks and podcasts when I don't have clients on the line because I'm sitting there working. I'll have it playing in the background. So, um, you know, same thing here with Brene Brown, uh, the John Maxwell, uh, Wayne Dwyer. I don't think he's on here anymore, but uh, Wayne Dwyer used to have a podcast. Um, TED Talks. Uh, super soul. So go find out what those podcasts are, not only because you want to listen to them and find out the topics, but you might, when you get your speaker sheet together and your book and your book one sheet and all that, you might want to go see if you can get yourself booked on those shows as well, because they might have the same audience. So very important to check out the podcasts. YouTube channel. You can see these same people I was just talking about with Brene Brown also have YouTube channels. So you can see how many subscribers do they have? What does this look like? I'm amazed that uh, G Elizabeth Gilbert only has 11,800 subscribers. She's one of my favorite. If you haven't read Big Magic, Big Magic is the best book because it literally tells you in it, if you have a big idea and you don't act on it, the universe is going to take it out of your head and give it to someone else. And how many times have you ever sat online and you've seen something new launching and you're like, wait, I wanted to do that. <laughs> or I could have done that. That could have been me. I know I've had one or two things that, that I've done that with. So um, go check it out. Go look at the YouTube channel. This is something, a YouTube channel, you can put your earbuds in. When you don't have clients on the phone, you can listen as well. What are the relevant topics they're talking about? Um, can you spin off of those? You don't want to copy them, but you definitely want to see how they're doing it and why it's so effective. So the importance here is relevant conversations, a study of social media content deliveries, and then who in your audience is following this. So this really informs your press and website as well, which we're going to go into next. So press and websites. This is another area to take a good look about at where is your audience consuming their information. So websites. I don't get a lot of this. I, I ran the Brene Brown thing again, and I did. I wasn't happy with the results, but here's why you want to go look at the website. If you're someone that is like Brene Brown, go over to Brene Brown's site and see what she's doing. What is her lead magnet? What is What are her programs? Are her programs one-on-one? -on -one? Are they downloadable, consumable? Work at your own pace, which we're going to see a lot more of in 2024 and 2025 as money gets tight. Um, does she have group programs? How does she sell her information? So that's what you're really looking at because if she, if you are like her, she is a competitor. Now she may be a big influencer competitor, but I would encourage you to make a list of your five biggest competitors out there and go look at their sites and take notes and figure out what they're doing, what they're doing successful and how you can do it, not copy it, but do it with your content. Press outlets. We live in a very divided America, unfortunately. So you want to be able to take your book and you probably have some favorite news channels that you listen to and you probably resonate with them. You think like them. But what's important about it is knowing where your people are at 
But then going to the other side, the other end of the media spectrum. So if you're a left-leaning person, hold your nose and go watch Fox or Newsmax or I can't even think of what the other ones are over there. Um, I listen to a lot of alternative media. I don't I don't bother with these anymore. And I have personal reasons for that. But um, the reason you want to do that is because when you discount a whole other segment of media, you are discounting your reach with your book. And here's a great example why I encourage you to do it. You're listening to what these people are talking about and their spin. Leslie Michaels had uh, in a fabulous book on feminism. And we had her with the booking agent and she kept telling the booking agent, I wanna be on CNN, I wanna be on MSNBC. The problem was is she was competing with a lot of big name influencers on those liberal channels. I know one time we actually lost out to Maureen Dowd, which if you're given a choice between Leslie, a relative unknown, and Maureen Dowd, of course the stations are going to, or the shows are going to choose Maureen Dowd. Now, here was the problem. Leslie didn't like the conservative media. Fox was reaching out. Newsmax was reaching out. There was a, a periodical, I think, as well, that was reaching out to her that was more conservative. And she kept telling our media booker, no, 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 no. But on that side, she had no competition. She could have been on spinning and talking about her book in a different way than she would have over on a liberal network. So it is important that you know where the information is being consumed by your audience, but it's also important that you listen to the other and figure out how your book is relevant and you can get your foot in the door on their media as well. So the important is relevant conversations, again, media, websites, looking for it all. Look at the key buzzwords they're using in their copy because that's really important too. And then how monetized content is delivered. So if you're struggling a little bit with selling things on your website, you might go over and look at theirs and say, ah, you know, I don't have a cheaper alternative to what I do. I ran this group program last year. Why can't I make that into a downloadable that I sell some Somebody that maybe doesn't have the funds, or maybe I can drive traffic from my book to or that lower cost product, because it's very rare that you go from a book into a big ticket. If it, a lot of times people will stair step because they, they want to get to know you a little bit better. And that book is definitely your first step. So consumer semantics, this is about how people find you. And I find that most of you will tell me your keywords, but when I run your book through AI software, AI tells me you've got a different bunch of keywords, which is not a good thing because we use keywords every book we upload. So one of our great opportunities as a publishing company is we can I uh, put one set of keywords into Kindle. We can put a second into Core Source, which is the ebook. We can do a third into Lightning Source, which means that when it all comes together on the distributor, there are tons of keywords there. So typically we will ask, like, what are your 25 keywords? We have AI programs now that I can put your book up in a PDF format and I can get an answer. Here are the 25 keywords for this book. Now I have stuff to advertise. I know what needs to go in my copy. I know what needs to go everywhere that I am promoting this book. So keywords are super important. And I'm going to talk a little bit about an AI course at the end. And one of the things that I will share with you is what we use for our keywords. And you can actually upload your book at, at intermediate stages and make sure that you're using those keywords effectively. Hashtags. I'm not going to get too deep into this because um you know, a lot of people don't use them, but I know when I use them over on LinkedIn, and I know a lot of others do as well, that if I go in and I put author platform in there, a lot of my stuff will come up. It'll also come up from other people, competitors that are using author platform. So I can see what they're producing. I can see the hashtags they're using. So you might want to do that as well. If you go over and you're looking at Brene Brown and you see she has three or four Hashtag, hashtags that she's using that aren't her name, don't use her name. Um, you can do some of those as well. And then when people are using the fat hashtags that you will get, they will get your articles and her articles. So, you know, you might get some random people that way that go over and go, 
hmm, I really like what this person has to say. And Brene Brown as well. I think I'll go check him or her out. So this is really a way for you to get maximum searchability and to be able to infuse your content so it's searchable and build the SEO not only on your platform, uh, your website, but your book platform and making sure that your publisher has the words they need to infuse the book publishing platforms with that as well. And that is super important. Finding the gold. So one of the things that we did this year, and we will have it ready next month for to quiz, is we started really looking into, I kept hearing from my clients over and over, I'm putting this language together, I'm running it through chat GPT, but nobody's connecting. And the, probably the part, this part is because you might have developed your avatar, but you don't actually look deep into the language and how to close a deal and how to close a book and what to do when presenting to these people. So your language matters when you're speaking to an audience. I'm going to go through this really quickly. I should have a quiz by the end of March where you can actually drop and drag and, and get all of the attributes of these people. But um, this is just a quick and dirty on it and, and sort of an explanation about why language matters with your audience. So AI requires that specificity to train. So the language you use in your book, in your presentations, especially if you're selling something, it all has to match. And it all has to match the language that your audience uses. Now, remember a few minutes ago, I said, if you're an expert and you're using jargon with a non-expert audience, chances are you're going to lose them. And that's because you're not speaking their language in one way, but there are other ways that you may not be speaking their language as well. So I'm gonna go through these four really quick and sort of give you an example of why this is important. So our first, Arch archetype is the go-getter. The go-getter is an influencer. They're action takers. They're really looking for continuous growth and improvement. They're very confident, probably sometimes overconfident, and they're on top of cutting edge things. They want to be the first to use something, to be the influence on our, uh, influencer on new platforms, new things to do. Now, I'm a go-getter and I will tell you most of my audience is go-getters, um, probably because, and you may find some of the same or you may not find some of the same. Um, usually we attract like-minded people. So I think that's where that go-getter comes in. But here's the deal. When I'm talking to somebody that doesn't fit this, I have the opportunity to say, I don't think we're a good fit because if you've ever had a bad client or someone who's picked up your book and it's just, you know, they don't have a good opinion of it. Most of the time it's because, you know, they'll just suck the life out of you. So you want to avoid it. So these influencer people, when I say action takers, the way you close someone like that is you talk to them and they think with their gut. So if they hear it, they're not impulse buyers per se, but they will, they'll gut check and they'll say, yeah, this sounds like something I can use. I can incorporate it in X, Y, Z. So when you're closing a deal or presenting to these people, you have to keep their attention. They're very, very easily bored. I mean, if you <laughs> if you spend any time with me, you'd know that I just, I, I don't have ADHD. I, I probably have ADHD, but um, I jump a lot. Um, I avoid shiny objects, but I jump a lot because I get bored with things. The next is the organizer. Organizers are really analytical thinkers. They're also visionary leaders and they're long-term planners. That's what makes them good visionary leaders is they don't just look at today. They look at where are we going to be a year from now? Where are we going to be five years from now? Where are we going to be 10 years from now? Which makes them very results driven because if they're not reaching those goals, they're not happy with it. They also are very solid negotiators. I can tell you that I've negotiated with many organizers. Organizers, probably my second language um, that I work with best on here. So this is why taking this back to building, rebuilding your avatar, these are people like accountants, lawyers, 
people who really sit down and think about these things, financial planners, they're numbers people. Um, so you want to be able to speak to them in that way. They're going to want to know if they read your book, what are my results I'm going to get from reading this book? Because I don't want to waste my time with a fluff book. So you really have to have this in it. You might want stats. If they're numbers people, they're probably looking for numbers. So keep this in mind, not only when you're writing your book, but if this is your audience, your social media posts are aimed in that direction. Everything is named in that direction. We actually had an organizer who wrote a book whose specialty is tech. And it's interesting because they're similar, but they're not the same. So she has to do a few newer things to be able to really connect with that audience. The next is the lover. And these are people who are, I would say, like spiritual people, um, also people like psychologists would be nurture people, um, maybe some doctors, although doctors, doctors tend to be a little bit analytical too. They have to be for their job. So these are people who are curious, they're creative, they're open-minded, but they're non-conforming. So it might be that they take an idea and they turn around and they say, oh, I think I'll do it this way. And it's more effective for them. They're also very much servers and their clients are servers. So the reason this is important is while I might close an influencer pretty quickly, the lover, uh, well, the influencer that I was talking about, the go-getter, the lover is a little different. I'm going to have to nurture. I'm going to have to answer questions. I'm going to have to sort of give them some scenarios. So a little bit different. They need a much softer touch, which you guys probably know me. I'm not super soft. I can do it, but it takes effort sometimes on it. The next one is the documenter. The documenter is the critical thinker. They don't make decisions quickly. They're very fact-driven detail oriented and very resistant to change. <laughs> I can't even tell you. So with a documenter, you want to come to the table with statistics, with uh, studies. If you came into it and you said, here's a Pew Research study, and it shows that, you know, 45% of people, and I'm making this up, are blah, 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 blah. They're not probably going to appreciate that you threw it out there. It's going to give you cred, but they're going to go look it up. They're not going to take your word for it. And they're very fact. They're not only that fact driven, they're very science driven as well. So they're going to go look things up. So um, these are people that you're going to have to take your time with. These are tech people. These are uh, engineers. I have to tell you, when I was in real estate, uh, I had an aeronautical engineer who, very wealthy, he's invented uh, plane parts, things that go on planes. And we were looking at a house out in a canyon in Los Angeles. And he literally said to me, what if that hillside catches on fire? Will my roof catch on fire? Do I have enough clearance? And how far away is the golf course if the irrigation system? And I sat there and I was like, Oh my God, this is like when my son was five. Why is the sky blue? Um, these are people who think through everything. Consider it for a moment. If 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 you ask me and an engineer to build a bridge, I, I could probably build a bridge, but I wouldn't encourage you to drive over it. That what if guy is the guy you want building your bridge because he's thought of every possibility how it would fall down. So that's why this is so important, how you speak to those people, how you write that book. You want that, those stats in it. Those are the people who are going to go to the back of the book. They're going to look at the footnotes. They're going to look at the uh, section in the back that has all the links and where to find things. That That's those people. So um, language matters, and it's important for you to learn how to identify these people because these are the people that you're going to attract on social media with language. They're going to be attracted through your content development, whether you have really sassy, like mine is, mine is influencer, sassy, fun, let's go, let's do this. Or is it going to be that, more that tech person that, you know, scientific studies show that apes are, I don't know, something, we'll, we'll make it up. Um, and that's the kind of thing you want to keep in mind when you're reading, when you're writing your book. Also, your campaign launch, you want to use that language that attracts people to that campaign. So here's a scenario why this matters. 
So imagine, think about the go-getter for a minute. So if I have written my book for a go-getter, but my audience is documenters, the documenters are going to be looking for those scientific facts. They are detailed data people. The go-getters are big picture people. So I've just turned off not only the documenters for my book, but if I've written it for the go-getters, but I may not have been using language all along that's attracting those go-getters. If I wanna close that documenter, I'm gonna have to do it in a very gentle way where I give them the space to go think about it because normally if you're closing a deal with a person like that they're not going to they're not going to close on the phone they're going to say send me a proposal i'll ask you questions i'll think about it i'll research everybody else on the planet and maybe i'll be back in a month because that's who i am i'm the documenter so you can see that it is really is important the way you talk to these people and understanding that audience and what their language is so um, as part of that, we have an AI platform building coming up in April of 2022. And what we're going to be teaching in that course is your niche, niching your avatar. We're going to get really deep workbooks, working on that very first week. We're going to be working on that avatar and rebuilding it. Next, the ne following week, we're going to be getting into the gold language identification. Who is it? How do we talk to it? What are the presentation skills? And like I said, we should have the quiz up then so you should know what that person is going in. Um, week three, we're going to spend on AI platforms for better results. So I'm going to walk you through some AI platforms, um, which ones you can uh, load a PDF into and get and ask questions, which ones you need to chunk down because a lot of the GPTs and things like that don't do what we call chunking well. So, you know, you might want to move to another. I know I've used Bard, which just uh, flipped over. They changed their name to Gemini. And I'm not a big fan of that one. I tend to use some other ones. What are the ones you use on YouTube? And then week four, I'm actually going to show you using Notion, YouTube, Opus, ChatGPT, and so and maybe, maybe another platform, how we actually streamlined our process so that our content calendar is done very quickly and how you can do it too as an author. Because it is really important. I know to all of you, as most of you are solopreneurs or you have a team, and if you're the rainmaker like I am, uh, you just don't have time to spend five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 hours a week doing that. You need to be on the phone with clients, servicing your clients, closing new clients, keeping that pipeline going. So this will be very helpful, especially if with all that I just said, you're also writing a book and building a platform. That's a lot of time. That's a big commitment. So anyway, that course is $14.97. Reach out to me. We don't have the landing page yet, but if you go to chatwithjuliet.com, you should be able to uh, set up an appointment and talk to me about it and see if it's right for you. And if you have questions today, since we didn't have um, the Q&A at the end, you can send me questions at Juliet, J-U-L-I-E-T, at superbrandpublishing.com. I usually don't give out my email, but I do understand that the tech created a, kind of a weird situation with this. Um, something we have coming up, Next week, uh, the first Friday of every month, unless there's a holiday, we do an author training. March 1st is going to be uh, Fran Acero, who is the senior tuber, and she's going to go into Beyond the Pages, unveiling profits for authors. And um, she has actually figured out how to use the membership function over on YouTube. And, and she has a pretty substantial membership over there, which might be something that some of you are interested in. But I would say at the bare minimum, if, whether you are on YouTube and all of you should be on Rumble, anything that you're doing on YouTube, you can probably do over on Rumble. Uh, less the censorship that YouTube does. You have to be really careful what you say over there because they will demonetize you. So if you want to sign up for this, go over to bamaglivetraining.com 
and uh, grab a spot. Uh, last time Fran was on, she taught something else back in December. It was the biggest turnout we've ever had. We we had a, a tremendous amount of people because everybody's kind of mystified about how YouTube works, what will supercharge. Um, we actually use TubeBuddy because, and we've learned a lot from Fran about how to supercharge the uh, the YouTube channel. And then um, I already talked a little bit about AI Author Academy coming in 2024. Um, it, it really is. We're gonna we're gonna take the garbage in, garbage out, out of this. You're gonna be putting in really clean, great stuff. The reason this is so important, and and I probably should have used this example while I was talking, is we had a client last summer that came to us for a quiz, and she had uh, ChatGPT write some really sassy, fun um, copy for the event that she was having but what she didn't do is go build that avatar and use the right language and it didn't work as well like the copy looked fantastic but she was really catering to influencers and i think her audience is really vacillates between that organizer and that documenter so we've gone back and we've tweaked a little and she's getting better results with it but she really didn't she put her her way of speaking into chat gpt and what she got back uh, didn't actually match her audience because she's a bit sassy, but she's kind of a geek too. So, um, you know, an SEO geek. So it, it is really important to streamline this and get all the uh, avenues in. The course is $14.97, by the way. So if you sign up now, it's in April. It, it's an easy two payment plan or you can pay all at once. And then a new product we have, we just partnered with the largest self-narration company for experts. And we now have Superbrand Audio, which if you have a book already or you're thinking about adding the book to your book launch program, this is really great because you can uh, do one launch with your ebook, soft cover, hard cover, whatever you're doing. And a lot of times we record this after your initial book's release. So you have another release six months down the line that'll give your book a second win. The point of the self narration. We have two ways we can go. We can you can self narrate with a producer. They actually give you a producer, and they take you through the process, and you get a fully formed product at the end. Or they can hire talent. So it can be done both ways. But if you're someone who has a YouTube channel or a podcast, or you're out speaking a lot, people are going to want to hear you read your voice when it or your voice reading the book. One of the things that happened, I would say, two thousand. 14 or 15, because I, I had her on my, my podcast back then was a different podcast called Ask Juliet. And I had Dory Clark on, and she's a big influencer. And with her very first book, uh, her publisher uh, got talent to read it. And so I, I listened to that first book. I listened to her latest book before the interview and she read her second book. And that was one of my questions because her reading her second book was so much more compelling than having the talent do it. So um, the other thing on this is since 2020, audiobooks have captured about 45% of the market. And the reason is, is so many people left the corporate America. Well, they're still in corporate America, but they're not going to the office where they fran on you wearing earbuds while you're working. A lot of people working at home, if they don't have jobs that they have to be on the phone a lot, their computer jobs, they will literally sit there like I do when I don't have clients and listen to audiobooks. And I mean, I should, I've been an audible person since I think 2008 or nine and I go through seven books a month on average. I literally shut down on the weekends. I don't do any, I, I try not to do any work and I don't listen to anything um, even remotely political like I would on a weekday. So I go through usually a book a day on the weekends um, with that. So if you don't have an audiobook yet, contact us at Superbrand Audiobooks and we'll see if we can set it up. The other thing that I love about this new platform that we have is we actually have what a lot of people don't that I love when I'm uh, listening to an audiobook. We have a feature where they will interview you at the end and there will be about a 15 minute interview at the end of the book. That is a great relationship building tool because people get to know more about you. And I know uh, I have one author in particular that I listen to the interview at the end of the book. It's, it's a spy, he writes spy thriller things. And I just 
just love his interviews because he talks about why he wrote the book and how he researched and, you know, just the nitty gritty stuff that you want to know. So anyway, that is it for today. And again, I apologize for the tech. Um, I think it was just a miscommunication. Um, I tried to record so Jared wouldn't. And I actually got a piece at the end where it showed that Jared turned it off and it turned mine off and just a mess. But you live and learn and tech is not always your friend. So anyway, and any of these, please reach out. We're always here for you. And I highly recommend this course. If you're struggling with content, content is your trust builder. And you definitely, definitely want to be able to build trust with your audience and take a good look at that formula that I had back at the beginning too and see how many books you're projected to sell now because when we start that course I'm going to ask you how many books do you want to sell what are your goals and how are we going to get there all right see you guys soon thanks for listening bye-bye